The Proterozoic Eon is the longest of the four eons of Earth's geologic history, and it is divided into three smaller eras, the Paleo, Meso, and Neo Proterozoic. And the Paleo Proterozoic actually includes some of my favorite rocks and locations, including uh, the inner gorge of the Grand Canyon. And uh, this is just below Phantom Ranch. And these rocks are over 1,700 million years old. In fact, just below this, a few miles downstream, is a location with the oldest known rocks in Arizona, clocking in at over 1,800 million years old. So the Inner Gorge, places in central Arizona near Prescott and Payson, the Four Peaks and the Mazatzal Mountains, and even down in the southern deserts and mountain ranges like um, the Sierra Australia South Mountains and uh, Phoenix Mountains with Piastor Peak. Uh, they all have rocks that are of similar age. Life during the Paleoproterozoic is kind of a continuation of that of the Archean, a uh, very simple prokaryotic life like the cyanobacteria here, but slow and steady photosynthesis over long geologic time periods has an effect, and we're going to see that cumulative effect at the end of the Paleoproterozoic on not just the environment, but on life itself. The Proterozoic Eon itself stretches almost 2 billion years, from 2,500 million years ago down to 541. Represented on this pie diagram here, you can see it's almost half, 40-some percent of Earth's geologic history is in the Proterozoic. This is an excerpt from the ICS geologic time scale showing the Hadean and Archean eons, and there's the Proterozoic. Zoic is a suffix meaning life, and Protero means before. And so this was named before we knew that there was life in these rocks and at this time. So Proterozoic is split into three smaller parts, the Paleo, Meso, and Neo Proterozoic. And these are the eras of the Proterozoic. The Paleoproterozoic era is 900 million years long, and this is uh, even longer than the entire Hadean eon. And here we see the, the timeline, and the Paleoproterozoic can be subdivided into smaller periods. And for our purposes, we don't really need to concern ourselves with these at this point. However, the farther we go into geologic history, it will be important for us to know the, the periods and sometimes even the, the smaller epochs of geologic time. Well, tectonics of the Paleoproterozoic include the formation of the important supercraton of Laurentia. And as we know, the modern North American craton is a collection of Hadean and Archean cratons and younger Proterozoic terrains, which are both exposed in areas of Canada and the northern U.S. and covered. Laurentia started small during the, uh, the Hadean and, and early Archean, but evolved and grew over time and is one of the major cratonic blocks that the Earth witnessed. So early Laurentia, we think, was made up of the, the craton uh, we call superior, and that's much of south central Canada and the north central U.S. Uh, include blocks like this, and they're to 3,800 million years in age. And Laurentia uh, will uh, um, go on to play a major part in the formation of larger uh, supercontinents over geologic time. It's one of the more important supercratons. So with time, early Laurentia merged with other supercratons and smaller cratonic fragments to form even larger continental masses. And the history is uh, a little bit complicated and it's somewhat obscure given the uh, exposures that we have still remaining. But we know that early Laurentia combined with Siberia 
to form something larger called Arctica, and this was about 2,500 million years ago, or around the, the beginning of the Proterozoic eon. Uh, and so from there, Arctica combined with a couple other cratons, namely Baltica and uh, some ones from the North Atlantic to create the Northern Europe, North American craton, which is an even larger conglomerate of cratons. So this one was about 1,900 million years ago. And then the combination of cratons that uh, are present in South America and Africa today uh, made up something called Atlantica back in the Proterozoic. And then it merged with Nina and the uh, remnants of the old supercontinent Ur to form a large supercontinent called Columbia. And this was at about 1,800 million years ago. And so this is probably the largest supercontinent to exist to date. And it lasted for a few hundred million years before it uh, rifted apart. So you can see the different components there that made up Columbia. Now, its exact configuration and the timing of, of everything, again, like I said, there's, uh, there's still some questions. There's some things we can say and there's some things we can't say in terms of exactly where things were. But we have a pretty good idea that uh, Columbia existed at that time with these different parts. So during the assembly of any supercontinent, there are mountain building events, which are basically caused as these cratons come together and collide. And the Trans-Hudson and Wapmay orogenies are two such events. And I give them both here because they were both similar in timing and they were both involved in creating material together to form a, a much larger version of Laurentia. And this occurred during the assembly of Columbia. And so there's different configurations that we can draw that show the evolution of plate tectonic settings and how the subduction zones brought cratons together and island arcs forming and how all this was accreted together to form a much larger continent. And so uh, during this time, Laurentia became larger with the addition of Wyoming and the Wyoming province to the um, southwest is right in here. Mojave province, which is another one. Uh, the Hearn and Ray and uh, Slave provinces were added to during this time. This Trans-Hudson origin is basically the, the where the mountain belt was, where the, kind of the collision zone where all these things were added on. Okay. And so kind of during this time too, on the southern margin, both the Yavapai and the Mazatzal terrains were added. It's interesting, uh, some of these rocks are present at the, um, the base of Mount Rushmore. Uh, not necessarily the, the granitic rocks that form the monument, but uh, uh, at the base there are uh, some of these ancient rocks that uh, record this deformational event, which is, represents the, the uh, assembly of the supercontinent, Columbia. Well, as I mentioned, there were several different orogenies going on over the span of a few hundred million years, and the Yavapai and Mazatzal orogenies were two that were fairly closely spaced in time, and they occurred on the western margin of Laurentia and it involved adding on new terrains to Laurentia to make it even larger. And so the Yavapai orogeny was first and it occurred around 17. 10 to 1700 or so, and it was a subduction related orogeny that added terrains, namely the Yavapai terrain, onto Laurentia. And so, this picture here shows basically the Wyoming craton, it's called Arcane Crust here, but that's the part of Laurentia that basically is the Wyoming craton. And then, these two different terrains here, like their microcontinental slivers or island arc sequences. Uh, were successively added on to the Wyoming craton here over time. So the Yavapai orogeny involved the addition of the Yavapai terrain onto the craton. And then later, 1675 down to about 1650, was the Mazatzal orogeny, and that involved another collision. The Mojave terrain was added on to the west. And so this is all in the western portion of the supercontinent. 
just a part of the supercontinent in terms of its tectonics. So the Yavapai orogeny around 1700 involved metamorphism and ductile deformation, folding and shear zones and stuff like that that are still exposed today in central Arizona, like here near Mayer. This is along Arizona 69. You can see the, the vertical foliation in these metamorphic rocks. This is a place where blocks came together and they were compressed and folded. We call those isoclinal folds where the folds are so tight that they parallel each other. And so uh, that represents the Yavapai orogeny. That's a new, the old smelter stack. It's still, last time I was up there, it's still standing. That was from the smelter at Mayer. And then the Mazatzal orogeny came uh, soon after that. And this was uh, more of an upper crustal kind of deformation, which involved folding and thrust faults. Uh, so a fold and thrust belt basically was formed from this. And we can see the effects of this still in the Mazatzal Mountains, like in Barnhart Canyon, where layers were crumpled into accordion-like chevron folds that are exposed in the canyon wall. Let's talk about a couple important rock types of Proterozoic Age. The first being banded iron formation, or BIF, which is composed of alternating iron-rich layers and chert. And so basically, uh, the iron-rich layers here in this picture are darker in color, and they're uh, interbedded with the reddish iron-rich chert layers. And remember, chert is a sedimentary rock, which is mostly silicon and oxygen. So uh, iron-rich chert and iron formation give you a, a biff. Okay, and so there's a couple different kinds depending on how they were formed, but the uh, the superior type of banded iron formation was abundant from 2,400 to about 1,800 million years ago, which is Paleoproterozoic. And these are important because these form the majority of our global iron ore reserves. Okay, and so they're in the United States, they're exposed in northern Michigan and Minnesota in various ranges like the Mesabi Range and some other ones. And they've been mined for their iron ore. And this is how we get steel to build our civilization. Well, as I mentioned, there's a couple kinds of banded iron formation, and the superior type is the one where it's thought to have formed in kind of a uh, shallow marine setting, like a continental shelf. And so in this kind of setting, you have cyanobacteria, which are floating in the water. So this pelagic cyanobacteria basically is doing its thing with photosynthesis, and creating oxygen and that limited oxygen is going into the water and basically being absorbed by the iron in the water and combining to make iron rich minerals like hematite and magnetite which then fall out of the water column and the layer on the seafloor okay and so this is what forms the gray layer and basically silica dissolved in the water from various sources combines with this oxygen as well and whatever iron is left over combining to form a iron-rich chert, or a ferruginous chert, otherwise known as jasper, which is the red layer. So the alternating red and gray layers, I think, might have something to do with, it could be seasonal, but basically it's a deposition related to the, uh, the cyanobacteria providing the oxygen, and it's being absorbed by the iron. This is one of my favorite rocks, probably in the top three. Love ferruginous chert. So that's got a name, it's called Jasper. Another important economic deposit is called vulcanogenic massive sulfides, VMS. Vulcanogenic meaning it has its origins due to hydrothermal vents related to C4 volcanism. Okay, so basically hot water percolating up through these vents with lots of dissolved elements, metals in them, and it, and it basically precipitates out these elements and minerals on the seafloor. And that's what we see today in black smokers, basically, where the, the uh, 
the black smoke basically is uh, hot water, hydrothermal fluid with lots of dissolved material in it. And uh, a lot of that is metals like iron and silver and gold and things like that. But basically in these chimneys, these hydrothermal vents, they represent little pipes basically of hot water with very highly mineralized water. And so these deposits are all located around these hydrothermal vents. We can see these today. Back in the Paleoproterozoic, these were very widespread. And these end up, like the banded iron formations, providing us with very valuable economic ore deposits. And the type of minerals you typically see in these situations are sulfide minerals, meaning that they're some combination of sulfur and other elements, but like pyrite, which is an iron sulfide, and chalcopyrite, which is an iron copper sulfur. So these are uh, typical examples of ore deposits that are paleoproterozoic in age. Well, shown here is the Verde mine as it is today. And this is a very important mine at the beginning of the 20th century. And its main ore deposit was a massive sulfide. And it's very rich in various sulfide deposits. These massive sulfide deposits were very important, not just for Arizona, but for the United States. Uh, if you remember the early 20th century, basically, we, we had World War II. And where did we get the material to basically win that war? Is from deposits like this. And this is a table which shows various mines around central Arizona. The Verde mine being the biggest one in terms of production. There's Big Bug and Mayer and some other ones. But even some ones farther south in Maricopa County that are a little bit smaller, but it shows the massive production of material that we extracted from these volcanogenic massive sulfide deposits. For example, the Verde mine, basically, how many zeros are we talking about there? That's 100,000 million, 3 billion pounds of copper from one mine. It's not just copper, but lead and zinc, gold, a million and a half ounces of gold, 57 million ounces of silver, etc. And so these were all operating during the 20th century and they've since been shut down. Some other rock types which are abundant and important that represent Paleoproterozoic geology across Western Columbia include plutonic rocks of different compositions, but mainly uh, granites and diorites. So the more felsic and intermediate plutonic rocks are fairly abundant. And these range in age from as old as 1840 uh, million years down to about 1662 to be exact. Okay, and so uh, as you remember, basically a, a felsic plutonic rock, we call that granite, and a intermediate plutonic rock, that's diorite. Very common in places like the Bradshaw Mountains of central Arizona. And here is the crazy basin quartz monzonite, which is a fancy word for basically a granite. And its age is about 1,700 million years old, and 1,699 to be exact. Beautiful, rugged terrain off to the west of I-17, forming much of the higher Bradshaw Mountains. We also see these rocks in the inner gorge of the Grand Canyon. And so down at the very bottom of the Grand Canyon are Paleoproterozoic rocks, and many of them are uh, Plutonic ones, the ones seen farther south in central Arizona. But the oldest one that I mentioned at the beginning is called the Elves Chasm Granodiorite. And so this plutonic rock has an age of 1,840 million, which is the oldest known rock in Arizona. And here it is. Basically, it's a uh, granodiorite. And it's been mildly deformed. In some places, you could almost call it a gneiss. And there are various other plutonic rocks that you see in the inner gorge from the darker ruby diorite darker color, more uh, iron and magnesium and calcium rich minerals in the rock. It's got an age of about 17, 16, and even younger ones of the cottonwood pegmatite complex where you can see these lighter colored intrusions, basically 
coursing through the darker metamorphic rock. These are all in the inner gorge of the Grand Canyon. A little farther south in the area we call the transition zone in Arizona, we have terrains like this near a little town called Dewey. It's the Cherry Springs Batholith, and it has an age of about 1740, the low rolling countryside, and the Prescott Granodiorite makes up much of the northern Bradshaw Mountains. A beautiful, big, rounded exposures of uh, plutonic rocks there, interspersed in the Ponderosa Forest. The Crazy Basin Quartz Monzonite, as I mentioned before, this is taken from the road going up to Crown Canyon. Beautiful, rugged terrain. And finally, farther south in southern Arizona, in the Basin Range, we have Paleo-Proterozoic Plutonic Rocks. In the Phoenix area, the Camelback Granite, and there's Camelback Mountain. And basically, with the head of the camel and the hump and the rump, Camelback Granite forms the, uh, the hump and the rump. Okay, and the head is much younger rock. And these are views basically up on Camelback. This, these are all... Paleoproterozoic and, and possibly younger granitic rocks. Beautiful terrain there. Somebody even built a castle upon the side of Camelback. Along with the Plutonic rocks formed along the western part of Columbia, uh, there are other rocks, and these are basically lumped into the Yavapai supergroup. A supergroup is a very large collection of different rock formations and different rock types. So the Avapai supergroup includes a whole bunch of different types of rock compositions, and they all have an age of about 1800 to about 1740. Okay, and these were formed in an island arc environment. And if, if you know what an island arc is, remember what that is. That's like uh, Japan, where you have one oceanic plate subducting underneath another, and you get a volcano above subduction zone, a line of volcanoes, an arc. And so those are island arcs. And so in that setting, you get volcanic and sedimentary rocks being deposited and that have since been metamorphosed. And so we can call that metavolcanic and metasedimentary. Here's a simple plate tectonic cross section of what we think the uh, Yavapai supergroup depositional setting is. And so the Wyoming craton is uh, over here on the left okay and there's an oceanic plate basically stretching off to the southeast and then it subducts underneath another oceanic plate and above that subduction zone is an island arc and that's where we think some of the rocks of the Yavapai supergroup were were formed and that includes a lot of the rocks in the Prescott and Jerome region and in the Bradshaw Mountains stuff like Those rocks represent this kind of plate tectonic setting. Even ones in the Grand Canyon, uh, called the Granite Gorge Metamorphic Suite, are probably correlative with the Yavapai Supergroup, formed in a very similar plate tectonic environment. Down in central Arizona, we see rocks like the uh, Ash Creek Group, these really tight isoclinal folds, and the uh, Big Bug Group, basically volcanics that have been metamorphosed and compressed and foliated. In the uh, transition zone, the Avapai supergroup includes a couple groups of uh, rocks, the Ash Creek and the Big Bug Group. And these are really cool rocks when you get out there. Off to the west of I-17, there's a road, an exit called Bumblebee Road, and that Bumblebee Road will take you to the uh, road, which eventually goes up into the high Bradshaw Mountains in a place called Crown King. And on the way, you'll pass through rocks of this Yavapai supergroup, which are really cool. There's banded iron formation, which is this dark ridge right here. There's a massive ridge of quartz, quartz vein, all basically in a bunch of metamorphic rocks, much like the Big Bug group you see here, which you can see farther up the road near Mayer. So notice the foliation in these rocks. Okay, fairly dark because those are metavolcanic rocks. Well, in the Grand Canyon area, the inner gorge is where we see the Yavapai supergroup. And there's some really cool rock types down there. They're all lumped into what we call the Granite Gorge Metamorphic Suite. 
these have a similar age to the rocks farther south, about 1750 or so. And they include the, uh, the Vishnu schist and the Brahma gneiss. And these are meta sedimentary and meta volcanic rocks, respectively. And these form the other part of the inner gorge, the plutonic rocks and these granite gorge metamorphic sweet rocks form the inner gorge that you see at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. So the Brahma schist and gneiss, these used to be mafic metavolcanics like basalt. The Vishnu schist used to be oceanic seafloor sediments. And there are other ones like the Rama schist, which is more of a, a felsic metavolcanic. So when you see pictures of the inner gorge, usually the darker colored rocks are these, and the lighter colored rocks are the plutonic rocks. Another major package of rocks is the Tano Basin Supergroup, which is exposed a little farther southeast in central Arizona. These rocks are similar to the Avapai rocks, but they're a little bit younger, 1710 to 1675 in age. And so uh, they're a little bit younger in age, and they include metavolcanics and metasedimentary rocks like the Yavapai supergroup. However, they were deposited in a continental arc environment. Okay, and so the Yavapai was an island arc where you had two oceanic plates basically colliding and one subducting underneath another. The continental arc is where you have a subduction zone of an oceanic plate basically underneath a continental plate. And so this Wyoming craton part of the Columbia supercontinent is the continental mass, and this oceanic plate was subducting underneath, magnus coming up, forming a continental arc, much like the Cascades of the Andes today. And those volcanoes and all these highlands were eroding, and their eroded material were being deposited in, in the shallow marine setting uh, just offshore. And so that is the environment for the Tano Basin supergroup basically a continental arc. A familiar landmark in the Phoenix area is Four Peaks off to the northeast, and that's the Mazitzal Group Quartzite. And so this very rugged and basically above 7,000 foot set of peaks here was originally deposited below sea level in a shallow marine shelf. It's as nice, clean, pure sand, which then was buried and compacted and metamorphosed and preserved and then up thrust and eroded to where it is today. It's amazing. So what you're looking at there is C4 sediments that are some of the highest peaks in central Arizona. There are other really cool rocks representing the Tano Basin Supergroup, including the Maverick Formation in Barnhart Canyon, where you can see the reddish shales and these lighter colored quartz beds, basically, which used to be sand. Now there are these lighter colored beds they're all squeezed by that Mazatzal orogeny into these really tight chevron folds. So that's the view right off the uh, the Barnhart Trail. Beautiful exposure of these folds right in the, in the canyon wall. So that's accessible. It's a pretty doable hike for most people. It's a great place to, uh, to see these kind of structures. Yeah, so in the central Arizona transition zone, this supergroup is made up of smaller groups like the Union Hills group or the Alder group or the Mazatzal group. And uh, there's cool rocks here. Here's part of the Maverick Formation, like you see at uh, Barnard Canyon, with uh, ripple marks in it. So shallow water ripples making this cool looking sedimentary structure that's still preserved. So these were ripples in sediment from 1700 million years ago. Here's a conglomerate of milky quartz class in the Mazatzal Peak Formation. It's now a meta-conglomerate because it's been metamorphosed, but how cool is that? All these different uh, quartz cobbles have been rounded as they tumble uh, near a beach or a high-energy environment, and uh, they're still preserved today. Well, a few other rock types to note exposed farther south in the basin range include rocks that make up the Sierra Estrella Mountains just southwest of Phoenix be the Estrella Nice and so uh, this rock unit is probably correlative with the Yavapai supergroup rocks and these are relatively high grade metamorphic rocks Nices and schists you can see the uh, Nisic banding here Rick's 
got his hand on an outcrop there. Western South Mountain, the whole western part of the range is made up mostly of this Australian nice. See nice folds in this Australian nice. But also a little farther east of Phoenix in the mountains, Paleoproterozoic canal schist is fairly common as well. In the Phoenix area, we see these rocks in the Phoenix Mountains. And this is the trail up to the Piestoa Peak Summit. And we're passing through various metamorphic rocks of phyllite, including phyllite, schists, quartzite, basically uh, all similar to that Australian ice in age, about 1,700 million. Here's basically from the peak, you can see the big angular blocks of quartzite. And so that's the view. This terrain down here is all metamorphic rock, and that's Camelback Mountain in the distance, again with the hump and the, the rump behind being Paleoproterozoic plutonic rocks. Well, let's turn our attention to the Paleoproterozoic climate, mainly the uh, Great Oxidation or Great Oxidation event. And to set the stage for this, before the Proterozoic, we think the atmosphere and the hydrosphere of the oceans were largely anoxic, meaning there was very little free oxygen. And any oxygen that was there was quickly absorbed by sediments on the surface. So that would be this area down here. Very minimal uh, oxygen. And after uh, about 2,500 million years, see an increasing amount of oxygen that was absorbed by sediments. And so this is reflected in the relatively large abundance of banded iron formations, of red beds, which are sedimentary rocks with a high iron content, hematite content, and the appearance of over 2,000 new minerals, which were which included oxygen in their chemical makeup. So these sedimentary rocks, these oxidized sedimentary rocks, record the buildup of free oxygen in the atmosphere and the hydrosphere, basically right at the beginning of the Paleoproterozoic. We call that the Great Oxidation. So some of the effects of increased oxygen in the atmosphere and hydrosphere include cooling of the climate, and this is mainly from the decline of the amount of atmospheric methane. Methane is CH4, and so with the higher abundance of oxygen available to bond with other elements. Uh, carbon, instead of bonding with hydrogen, is now bonding with oxygen to form CO2. So we see a rise in the amount of CO2 and also the amount of water because uh, not only is carbon bonding with oxygen, but hydrogen as well to form uh, H2O. So we think that when you bring down the amount of the super greenhouse gas methane, uh, that basically cooled the climate. Also, extinction of some of these simple chemosynthetic organisms and photosynthetic organisms that are sensitive to the amount of oxygen in their environment. That uh, basically uh, levels of oxygen could be toxic to these and, and cause their decline or even extinction. And finally, evolution. Basically, this is uh, this coincides with the appearance of the first eukaryotic life forms in the rock record. And so the rise of atmospheric oxygen is quite likely the, the impetus to form new, more complex life forms in the world. Well, one major effect of the Great Oxidation was quite likely Earth's first major ice age called the Huronian Ice Age. And this occurred and the Paleoproterozoic between about 2,400 and 2,100 million years ago. And so uh, here's the Huronian, here's the Proterozoic Huronian Ice Ages here. And it's a, a major set of glaciations, not just one, but probably several, strung out over a few hundred million years. And it's possible that these glaciations were of such an extent that they represented snowball earth conditions where the glaciations were spread over large areas of the landmass and it might have incorporated much of the planet. This shows where we think 
Laurentia was during this time. And during the early Proterozoic is when Laurentia went from near equator in its position down to southern latitudes. So again, this cooling was probably brought about by the decreasing amount of methane in the atmosphere from the increased about amount of oxygen. Paleoproterozoic life, again, at the beginning was fairly simple and mostly unicellular, prokaryotic, much like what's preserved in the gunflint chert, about 1.9 billion years old. But it's around this time where we see the first fossils of eukaryotes, and life forms that have uh, cellular nuclei, so the DNA is in a nucleus. So how did this come about? And there's different ideas, but the simple one is endosymbiosis is one way to say it, where you're combining two different prokaryotic organisms of different kinds, and over time they evolve into one, and this one organism basically has uh, the characteristics of a eukaryotic organism. And so whether it's a, an animal or a plant, depending on what is being incorporated, the outcome is something that is more complex than has a cellular nucleus. And so one of the first fossils we see is something called Grypania. And this is a coiled multicellular type of algae and its age is about 2100 million. And there are also these fairly complex structures called acrotarchs, which are a little bit younger, but we think that these represent the organic structures that are eukaryotic in nature. So this diagram shows the evolution of life or its history and mainly the three different types. Uh, bacteria basically started evolving during the Archean and has been radiating ever since. And the same thing goes for extremophiles in the domain Archaea. But it was in the Proterozoic, where we first see eukaryotic organisms develop, and from that we see later plants and then animals. Yes, and finally our old friends, the stromatolites, which were around since the, the Archean, are now becoming more abundant in the Paleoproterozoic, and they'll continue to increase throughout the Proterozoic. All different kinds of stromatolites existed and still exist, but we think that basically in shallow marine areas of the Paleoproterozoic uh, is a time of flourishing for stromatolites. So present-day Shark Bay here, and this could have been a Shark Bay of the past, with slightly different atmospheric 